hazardous materials are all around us, stored in facilities and carried on transportation lines. When handled properly, these chemicals go unnoticed. But when an accident occurs, you need to be ready to face these dangers to protect your community. Being trained as an operations level responder based on NFPA 472 will prepare you to deal with this threat safely and effectively. The first steps you need to take when you arrive on scene are to identify container shapes, recognize container markings, and look for signs of criminal activity. To help you understand each of these requirements, your learning objectives are to understand the shapes and typical contents of hazardous material containers, interpret facility and transportation container markings, identify conditions surrounding hazmat scenes, and recognize the signs of criminal or terrorist activity. When your team arrives at a hazmat incident, your first task is to find out what materials are involved. Knowing the shapes of containers and how to read their markings will help you make this critical determination. The first general category of containers you need to recognize are those used in rail transportation. The Department of Transportation is the authorizing agency for rail cars. The acronym DOT followed by a designation number is used to signal first responders of the chemicals on scene. The first type of rail car you need to recognize is the cryogenic liquid tank car or DOT-113. The DOT-113 carries liquid hydrogen and has the silhouette of a thermos bottle on rails. It is a high pressure tank car and presents a rupture risk in certain situations. Non-pressure tank cars are the next category of rail containers you are required to recognize. The DOT-103 has a cylinder shape with rounded ends and a circular silhouette. It usually has a valve on top with an access walkway. DOT-103s carry acids, peroxides, oils, and caustic commodities. Another non-pressure tank car is the DOT-104, it has the same shape and silhouette of the DOT-103, but carries ether, gasoline, and vegetable oils. The DOT-111 is a non-pressure tank car that carries acids, fuels, and oils. It can be longer than a DOT-104, but shares the same valve configuration and silhouette. The last non-pressure tank car you need to recognize is the DOT-115 that carries latex, corn syrup, and other liquids. It has a similar silhouette to the other non-pressure tank cars. The next general category of rail car you need to recognize is the pressure tank car. These cars are cylindrical with rounded ends. Some have exposed structural supports, others have an insulated outer shell. The DOT-105 carries liquefied fuel gases, chlorine, and other highly dangerous materials. The DOT-114 often contains anhydrous ammonia and liquefied petroleum gas. Pressure tank cars have heavy-duty valves that can fail if enough stress is placed on the container. Other car types do not use a DOT marking at all, but still contain hazardous materials. One of these is the pneumatically unloaded hopper car. These carry flour, plastic pellets, and a variety of powdered materials. Some of these fine materials may be hazardous. Another unmarked rail car is the tube car, which holds tubes within a wooden or metal housing. These tube cars carry helium, hydrogen, and methane that may pose an explosion risk. The next type of container you need to quickly identify 
is the intermodal tank that can be transferred between trains, ships, or trucks. Intermodal tanks use the acronym IM for intermodal, followed by an identification number. These containers include the IM-101 or Type 1 container that usually carries non-flammable liquids and mild corrosives, or the IM-102 or Type 2 container that looks very similar to the Type 1 but contains flammable materials such as liquefied petroleum and corrosives. Some intermodal containers do not use a marking system. The most common is the C container. Any number of items can be stored in them, including hazardous materials. The pressurized intermodal tank is another example of an unmarked container and carries flammable gases such as chlorine, as is the specialized intermodal unit such as the cryogenic tank that carries liquefied gases. The third type of container you need to recognize are those used in highway transportation. These containers use the acronym MC for motor carrier, followed by a type number. Common types include the MC-306 non-pressure liquid tank, commonly called the gasoline tanker. These carry all types of liquids, from gasoline to alcohol to food products. They have an oval shape and silhouette and appear cylindrical from the side. Newer MC-306 tanks are made of aluminum, have bottom valves, and are restricted to 9,000 gallons or 34,059 liters of materials. The MC-307 low-pressure chemical tank transports flammable liquids, acids, and poisons. These tanks are insulated with a horseshoe shape or are uninsulated with a round shape and stiffening rings. MC-307s have a top manhole and can carry up to 6,000 gallons or 22,706 liters of material. The next type of tank you are required to recognize is the MC-312 corrosive liquid tank. These top-loading tanks typically carry up to 6,000 gallons or 22,706 liters of liquid acids. They are round with stiffening rings that provide rollover protection. MC-312 tanks have a small diameter and can carry water-reactive chemicals. The MC-331 high-pressure tank carries ammonia, propane, and butane. They are typically painted white or another reflective color and are marked flammable or compressed gas. The MC-331 has round dome-shaped ends and looks like a cylinder in silhouette with internal and rear outlet valves. The MC-338 cryogenic liquid tank looks like a thermos bottle on wheels. It carries liquid oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen. The loading valves are located in the rear and may be marked refrigerated liquid. Like rail cars, certain cargo tanks are not included in the marking system, but you are still required to recognize them. An example of this is the compressed gas tube trailer that carries helium, hydrogen, oxygen, and other gases. It contains individual steel cylinders banded together with protected valves in the rear. The manufacturer's name may be on the cylinders for identification. You also need to recognize the dry bulk cargo tanker that carries oxidizers, corrosive solids, cement, and fertilizers. A distinctive feature is its over-the-road bottom valve. NFPA 472 requires you to know at least one hazard associated with frequently used containers. The MC-306 tanker truck is a classic example of this because so many are on the roadway. When the MC-306 is carrying gasoline, it poses a fire hazard as well as the potential for contaminating nearby water sources. 
quickly recognizing its shape and contents can streamline your assessment of the scene. The MC331 pressure tank carries liquid petroleum and butane that can explode. Recognizing its silhouette and locating its outlet valves may help speed your response time. You should also be very familiar with the MC338 cryogenic liquid tank. This container may rupture or generate a serious fire hazard. The fourth type of containers you need to quickly recognize is often called non-bulk packages. These include bags that carry anything from food items to poisons, carboys used to protect glass bottles that hold acids and bases, cylinders that can hold materials up to 5,000 psi or 34,473 kilopascals, and drums that contain a wide range of materials and come in many shapes and sizes. The fifth and final group of containers you need to quickly recognize are those used to transport radioactive materials. They can be found in a facility, intermodal unit, rail car, or highway container. Type A radioactive containers are usually steel drums or boxes designed to carry low-level waste such as pharmaceuticals and smoke detectors. They are designed to withstand minor impacts. Type B containers carry highly radioactive materials and are designed to withstand severe accidents. They are typically made of heavy metal casks and carry nuclear fuel and high-level radioactive waste. Industrial containers are used for low-level waste from soil, construction sites, and debris. They are usually large metal boxes that can be easily transported. Accepted containers carry low-level radiation and can be made of fiberboard, wood, plastic, or steel. They are called accepted containers because they present an extremely low hazard and do not require labeling. Every incident is different, but you need to know how to identify containers to get a general understanding of what hazardous materials may be on scene. Once you've identified the shape of the container, you are ready to interpret their markings to help you determine what chemicals you are dealing with. This is what the placard system was designed for. The Department of Transportation has divided hazardous materials into nine classes, each with their own distinct placards. These placards may be generic to a certain class, show the name of the class, or contain a UN identification number of the specific product being carried. You need to quickly read and interpret these placards to help determine scene safety and understand exactly what materials you may be dealing with. Class 1 explosive placards are orange, include an explosion symbol, and have a numerical hazard class and division. These may also show compatibility groups A through S on the placard. Class II gas placards use four different colors. Non-flammable gas placards are green with a cylinder symbol. Flammable gas placards are red with a flame symbol. Toxic or poison gas placards are white with a skull and crossbones. And oxidizer gas placards are yellow with a flaming circle. Class III flammable liquid placards are red with a flame symbol with the words flammable, combustible, or flammable liquid written within the placard. In some cases, the product name such as gasoline or fuel oil will be written in the placard. Class IV flammable solid placards are marked with a flame pictograph with red and white stripes or are half red, half white. For materials that are dangerous when wet, a blue placard is used. Certain flammable solids carry the Apply No Water placard, which contains the red and white stripes of the Class IV Division I materials, but also has a blue top that includes a W with a line through it. 
This W means add no water. Class 5 oxidizer and organic peroxide placards are yellow with a burning circle symbol. Class 6 poisonous material placards are white and may be marked with a skull and crossbones and the words poison or toxic. If you see a PG3 marking, it means packing group 3. If you see a wheat stalk with an X through it, you are dealing with a poison that is deadly if swallowed. Packing groups indicate the degree of danger a hazardous material presents within its class or division and designate the strength of the package required for shipment. Class 7 radioactive material placards are half yellow, half white, or all white with the trifoil logo. Class 8 corrosive placards are half white, half black, with the symbol of test tubes dripping on an iron bar and a hand. Class 9 placards are white with black bars on them to denote miscellaneous hazardous materials. The dangerous placard indicates a mixed load. The placard system can be a great help to first responders. However, be aware that placards are only required for loads greater than 1,001 pounds or 455 kilograms. As many as 20% of trucks carrying hazardous materials do not have placards or are using them incorrectly. Markings on rail transport cars and intermodal equipment use placards, but also include a shipping name of the material, the UNNA identification number, and in the case of intermodal containers, hazard-specific markings that may be referenced in the front of the DOT guidebook. Each of these markings will help you determine what chemicals are on scene and how to mitigate their dangers. Should you be called to an incident at a facility, several types of markings could provide valuable information to your team. The NFPA 704 system is commonly used to warn of hazardous materials within a structure. Like the DOT system, NFPA 704 uses diamond-shaped placards to warn of various hazards. NFPA 704 is divided into four parts. Each part is given a color and number to show the type and severity of the hazard. The blue section indicates a health hazard. Red is for a fire hazard. Yellow is for a reactivity hazard and special hazards are marked with white. The higher the number within each portion of the placard, the higher the danger level. Some containers within facilities will have markings that list the product name and amount of product being stored. Facility storage tanks often include this information. Facilities that store pesticides also use the 704 system. No matter what amount of pesticides are being contained, they are required to list their name, signal word, pest control product number, precautionary statement, hazard statement, and active ingredients. This will help you determine the best practices for mitigating its danger. When you respond to a facility that uses radioactive materials, such as a hospital, you need to be able to recognize their vertical bar markings, contents, activity, and transport indexes. Should you be required to deal with an incident involving a pipeline, look for markings that indicate the types of materials in the pipe, the name of the pipeline owner, an emergency contact number, and the active ingredients within the pipe. Finding the markings on buildings and pipelines are crucial steps in determining scene safety and how you will handle the incident. In addition to the dangers of the hazardous materials themselves, you need to be ready to deal with dangerous conditions surrounding the incident scene. If the incident is out of doors, NFPA 472 requires you to account for dangers from topography, such as hills and valleys, land use, such as public spaces or agricultural areas, bodies of water, such as streams or lakes, 
and weather conditions at the time of the incident. You also need to account for accessibility to the scene through gates or roads, exposure risk to the public in nearby buildings and homes, the nature and extent of injuries to subjects, and the potential for secondary contamination from victims. Finally, take note of nearby storm and sewer drains, wires and pipelines from local utilities, nearby transportation corridors such as rail lines and highways, and ignition hazards from nearby fires or sparks. When responding to a facility incident, you must also recognize factors that can impact scene safety such as floor drains, ventilation ducts, and air returns. Identifying utilities, power sources, and lockout tagout procedures could be of great assistance in your response. You also need to be aware of other engineering controls such as valves and shutoff devices that may aid you in gaining control of the scene. Lastly, you may need to identify hazards posed by criminal or terrorist activity. Keep an eye out for evidence of bombs and explosive devices, booby traps, secondary attacks aimed at emergency responders, and individuals carrying firearms. If you see any of these warning signals, immediately contact law enforcement. To initiate an effective hazmat response, it is crucial that you gather as much information as possible before any actions are taken. Quickly identifying the containers involved, their markings, and any hazards on scene will dramatically improve safety. In this program, you have learned about the shapes of hazardous material containers, facility and transportation container markings, identifying scene hazards, and recognizing terrorist and criminal activity. Nearly every jurisdiction has some form of hazardous material in storage or on transportation routes. Knowing how to properly survey a hazmat incident scene will lead to an effective response and increase safety for responders and the public alike.